Okay, well, welcome back. Hold on, I'm having some. All right, that's a little better. Okay, welcome back. Hope everyone's doing okay. Um, don't forget today is the exam. It, it is open, it's been open now for three hours and it will close tonight at uh, 10 p.m., okay? So give yourself plenty of time, at least uh, on average, the exams, when I look in previous uh, semesters, they take about an hour online time. Uh, so give yourself a good hour and a half or so, okay? Uh, so it, it, they shut down at 10, so please don't, don't start at 9.59 because that won't work. All right, because uh, Canvas will cut you right off. All right, so do you have any questions? Are there any questions concerning uh, the previous chapters, one through three? Uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question. If not, uh, I will continue with chapter four, okay? Any com comments, questions, or if you don't want to unchat yourself or unmute yourself, feel free to write it in the chat. Yeah. Okay, then I will continue with um, the chapter. Now, now what we're going to start talking about is getting into the chemistry and into the atoms and getting into um, Oh, let me close some things here because it puts a little strain on my bandwidth here. Okay. And so this chapter deals with the atoms and it kind of gives us a model. And I repeat, it's a model of what we think atoms are put, to, how they're put together relative to each other. <clears throat> now we have learned a lot of information about atoms over the, the years. Um, we, we have learned that, uh, well, first of all, we're going to talk about only three components of the atom. We're going to talk about uh, the nucleus, which consists of what is called the proton and the neutron. And then we're going to talk about the electrons, where our model shows that these electrons are around the nucleus. Now, it's been shown that these uh, components are subatomic particles. <laughs> are made up of even smaller particles, but that's beyond the scope of this class. So we're going to limit our conversation with respect to those three major components. OK? All right. Uh, someone had a question. I, they unmuted yourself. No? OK. Well, Dalton. Okay, now keep in mind, keep in mind the time scale here where we were talking about. We start off about 1800, right? Beginning 1808. Scientist comes along, says um, by the name of Dalton, he has a theory, an atomic theory. <laughs> he uh, proposes that an element, based on what we knew about elements at that time, it, and obviously at that time we did not have the full 118, but of the elements known at the time. It was proposed that an element was made up of tiny indestructible, indestructible particles, which are called atoms. Now, the idea of the concept of the atom is really not a new concept. The Greeks talked about that way back when, about the atom. Anyway, Dalton borrowed a little bit from them and said that they are indestructible uh, uh, particles. Well, that's not quite true because we've learned that that the particles themselves can be broken down even further, the sub subatomic particles. Okay. Now, he also proposed that all elements, all atoms of an element are identical and have the same properties. Identical is a true statement. Having the same properties, not quite. Okay. For example, carbon. We all know or should know, or maybe don't know, but. Carbon, for example, can exist in multiple forms. Specifically, it could exist in the form of a diamond, which is the hardest thing on earth, 
okay? And, or it could be uh, in the form of uh, in sheets and make up what is called what is called the dry lubricant. Totally different. It's made up of the same atoms, okay, of carbon, but the way they are put together relative to each other changes the, the properties 100%. Totally different. Um, we've, he also proposed that atoms of different elements combine to form what are called compounds. So in here, we see an example of two diatomic atoms. Remember, there's seven elements out there that exist as diatomic form. They can exist by themselves. Okay, have no fear of ice cold beverage. Remember those guys? Okay, so this example of it could be anything here in the lab where we got uh, two diatomic elements that react and create two new compounds. So the whole, the two new compounds are made such that now we got a red and a green together, okay? Whereas before we had two greens together. Now, this also brings up the point, if we count the, the, uh, the red sears and the green ones, guess what? This thing is balanced, why? We got two red ones here and two green ones. And once we are done making compounds, we still have two red ones and two green ones. They just happen to be in a different form, okay? And that, that is an example of conservation of matter. So throughout this, this whole thing, we're gonna, and here we have this, what we call balance. This, this equation is balanced because the atoms are balanced. And that's based on one of the, the laws of physics is the conservation of matter. Uh, I started with two reds. I still have two reds at the end as a new reactants, but they're in different forms, okay? All right, so we got a balanced chemical equation. Not only that, something else to take away from this, guess what? In, let me change it to a different, we'll leave it at red. In front of the diatomic red and diatomic green, since there's no number, we can say it's understood that there's one diatomic red and one diatomic green to form, you know, if I weren't to hide, just hide this up, I can put a two in front of the products, you know, and that show this one here, okay? And so I have a relationship of one diatomic green reacting with one diatomic red to give me two new red green products, okay? And I got a ratio here where I can write this ratio. Remember how we did, we just did this chapter about uh, conversion units. And I said, we're gonna use that technique of, of keeping track of our units. Guess what? I can, I have a, a relationship here where I can put one, let's say green, I'm gonna call it G for green, over one R for red, where I can write it one as, as in that manner, or I can invert it, where I got one R and one green, okay, of whatever that compound or element is, and that's a ratio. And <laughs> guess what? When we start calculating, we could say things like, okay, I need to make uh, 50 grams of this new product here, whatever this red green product is. And no, asking that question, I can, I need to figure out, well, how many, how many grams of the green do I need? Okay. And guess what? I have a relationship here between one diatomic green and two products. That's a ratio. Okay. So balancing, we're going to start, we're going to learn about how to balance chemical reactions. They're very crucial because when we balance it, we're telling it that we have uh, whatever amount of elements to start off with, I'm going to have the same amount when I end. And this ratio I'm going to utilize to do any type of calculation. All right. Much more on that later on. Uh, another aspect about Dalton's atomic theory is that compounds come together in small whole numbers. Okay. So we, we don't deal with, you know, a quarter or a half an atom. It is a whole atom. And they come together in a specific ratio. 
if we look at the formula, H2O, which we're all familiar with, hopefully it's water, okay? That is the formula for water. And we see a subscript here, two uh, in front of the H. Well, that tells you that there are two hydrogens combined with oxygen, okay? Not half, not quarter, but two whole atoms of hydrogen combined with, uh, with oxygen. Now, you might be tempted to say, well, you know, that looks like diatomic hydrogen or gas. Well, it's not because it's written right immediately after the H is written right. Immediately is an O for oxygen. Okay, so that tells you that it's not diatomic hydrogen, but it, it is compound hydrogen because there's an atom immediately bond or shown immediately after the hydrogens. Okay. I say that because a lot of times I've seen it before where people, uh, students have mistaken that two in front of the in that hydrogen thinking that it is diatomic hydrogen. Well, that's not the case. Structurally speaking, which we're going to learn about what the structure is, hydro, uh, water has the oxygen in the middle. We're always going to have a central atom. Okay, and you'll be always to be told, you'll be aware who is the central atom. And all of the other hydrogen, uh, uh, the other elements are bonded to the central, central atom. H2O, the central atom is oxygen. And bonded to that are the hydrogens. And that line that I just drew here represents a bond between oxygen and hydrogen. Okay? All right, but instead of having to draw it out like that all the time, we just draw it out, write it out as H2O. Okay, so uh, atoms of two or more elements can form uh, to combine, they can combine to form different compounds, okay? For example, when we combine carbon and oxygen, you can get one or two products. One, you can get CO, both in capitalized, carbon monoxide. Okay, notice the name, carbon monoxide, which is de depicted in this uh, model here. Or we can create uh, carbon dioxide, where you have two oxygens bonded to the central atom. In this case, it is the carbon that is the central atom. So you can see the oxygens are bonded. Now, as a general guide, with the exception of water, I, I, I've just talked about the central atom. Water, because of convention, the way it's been written, they, people were been written as H2O. And oxygen is the central atom. But 99% of the time, it's the uh, what is written is a central atom is written first. So you can notice that carbon is written first in carbon monoxide and in carbon dioxide. Okay. And then whatever follows are the atoms bonded to the central atom. Okay. Totally different compounds. We know carbon monoxide are poisonous gas. Carbon dioxide is a gas that uh, plants need for their survival. Okay, and there's a subtle difference between the two is that the, uh, one has an extra oxygen, totally different properties and so forth. Okay, so notice we started 1801, right? So we had this model going along and then around getting close to the turn of the 1900s, we start getting a lot more um, ideas and, and theories about atoms and how they're put together. But in order to, to get the theory that we have now, things had to be uh, discovered. Um, and it's really fascinating that in the 1900s, there was so much, was so much work that was being done on the model of learning what an atom was made up with. But this is the same time period that Einstein was around. So Einstein, we're all familiar with him. We all know who he is. But, you know, there were other scientists just as... As, as good, I should say, as Mr. Ed, Mr. Dr. Einstein. But, you know, um, 
it'd be good in your field. Einstein is totally different ball game, you know. So anyway, 1897, okay? A British scientist by the name of J.J. Thompson. What he is giving credit for is the discovery of an electron, okay? Now, keep in mind the model. We have, right now, the subatomic, three subatomic particles in uh, um, what we consider the nucleus, it consists of the proton and the neutron. And then the electron is, is orbiting somewhere around all that. But we didn't know this, okay? Nothing was known. So we had to learn about these subatomic particles. So he determined uh, using what we call cathode rays, which by the way, is the beginning, this is the, the crude old fashioned television. I know we're all of us have, are used to the old LED television, but uh, you may have some grandparents that may still have an old fashioned key, TV that has a the pretty heavy and they're uh, kind of elongated. It's not a flat screen by far, but in the back of that thing is a Ford magnets. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about this little video and uh, keep in mind, this is the beginnings of the television. <laughs> it really is. But the main part to take away here is that the electron was discovered, okay? Uh, here we go. Now, note here, we got this particle that's being generated, denoted by the red dots. And then they hit a screen, okay? And that screen has a colored green, uh, green uh, color. Well, what that is, is this. On that screen is a, mater a material, coated material. When that particle has full energy, hits that surface, so that green surface over here, it transfers that energy that the particle has that's traveling to the particle on the surface, okay? And that particle absorbs that energy and it excites it into what we call the excited state, okay? Well, atoms don't like to hang out there in the excited state very long. Guess what? They come back down to the ground state it began with. In that process of going from the excited state to the ground state, they will emit that, get rid of the energy, conservation of energy that they absorb from the particle. Sometimes what happens, you give that energy up as heat. A lot of times you give it up as light. And that's what you see here, that green color is the particle on the surface, the fluorescence material on the surface that is uh, dissipating the energy and going back to the ground state. But keep in mind, this is a television. The beginnings, if you're over here on the right side looking at the TV screen, uh, that's basically the basic unit of the cruising. And here's the part, that, the, the awesome part is about this experiment. When they put a potential plate there with a positive and negative charge, it caused that particle to be deflected, okay? Which implies that that particle must be charged. And any particle that travels that is charged also has a magnetic component to it. All the electrical, uh, current that passes through our everything, through a cable, any extension cable, anything like that, has associated with it a magnetic unit force, I should say, a component, okay? That's why we can make electric motors. That's why we can make generators because we are, we, we are either playing with the magnetic component or playing with the electrical movement component, okay? So that particle move, moves so it, it had a lot of implications.
And that's the part that, why is it negative? Because of the, of the plate. We knew the positive side and which direction that plate, that particle is being deflected. The negative is being attracted to the positive, okay? Here in this case, we're putting a magnetic field to this. So JJ is, he's putting a magnetic field to this, and it's also deflecting the, the beam. Okay. And that, that's where the old fashioned television comes in out, because in the back of the old fashioned television, there are four magnets. Okay. And I'm um, taking that signal and, and uh, moving it through the screen. Anyway, let me continue. Now, we're not going to get into, obviously, into this equation at all. But what he was able to determine was that ratio, the char uh, charge to mass ratio. And uh, which really didn't allow, so when you've got this ratio here, uh, if you can figure out a constant or you can figure out that constant that you show here, one point, negative 1.76, guess what? You can calculate the other variables. And that was utilized to calculate the mass of the electron. And we're going to learn about the mass of the electron. It is extremely tiny and small. And such that, that uh, we basically give it a mass of zero, a relative mass of zero for the electron. And the awesome part about these crazy electrons, as I stated it before, I said, that's, this is what got me interested in, in, in chemistry is these electrons with such a small mass have such a large function with respect to everything around us. This is all the electrical components that you're utilizing right now to listen to me talk about this uses electrons, the current, the battery, the charges, uh, even the image that you're viewing, you're getting electrons going through the screen and exciting the molecule so you can see the screen in front of you. This is the, That's a result of energy being transferred back and forth. Anyway, we're able to, with this ratio, calculate the mass of an electron. All right. So... What AJ proposed, and guess, okay, 1904, okay, so you're we're getting into the 1900s. He proposed that the atom uh, was basically in the center was some positive charge. And then around someplace, somewhere, we had these electrons, okay? We called it the plum pudding model. That was the best model at the time, given the data and the information we had. All right. So 1904. Here comes a few years later, another famous scientist, physicist named Rutherford, another British scientist. And what he did was really awesome. What he did, um, he took these particles again, and he uh, use some pretty big particles. We call them alpha particles. They're, they're, they're big. And he shot them through a gold foil. Okay. Now, based on the, the model that they have, the plum pudding model, what should happen is uh, all the particles should go right through the gold foil. Nothing else is happening. But that's not what he found he found that some of these particles are being ricocheted. 
it's like shooting pool. If you shoot pool and you want to get that ball to the you know corner pocket, you gotta have the right angle and so forth. And you can make that ball, you gotta do the corner pocket, the side pocket, or whatever. Okay. And so that's what kind of shook up the model of the plum pudding. So let's let's listen to his uh, video. Now, he used the same, somewhat the same procedure, and as you got the particles being running through a, a hole just to, to uh, focus them, here's the, in the center, you got the gold foil, and then surrounding that is a, a uh, some of that fluorescent material, okay? And also the same, same situation, those particles hit the surface of that material and cause a light, so you can see. Notice that some of these particles are being angled off, being shot off at a different angle, okay? And so that kind of, well, come back. And that's, that's the situation that they were being scattered and they were like, whoa, what's going on here, okay? The fact that they're being scattered suggests that the atom, there's something in the atom that's pretty hefty, hefty enough to cause that particle that is, it is being shot to it to angle it off. And oh, come on. Okay, so to the and the left uh, is the plum pudding model where it was thought that that the bulk of these particles would just shoot through, but the fact was that based on Rutherford's um, work, there was some particles that are being ricocheted and sent off at different angles. So he proposed that uh, Rutherford proposed that there must be a nucleus, a very heavy nucleus in the center of these uh, in the center of the atoms uh, that are a lot more dense and heavier than the particles he was shooting for them to cause these particles to be ricocheted, okay? So Rutherford is credited with discovering the proton slash nucleus, okay? But there's a nucleus. Now, down the road is not until like 20 some, almost 20 years later, 15 years, I guess. Yeah. Uh, another scientist, English scientist, Chadwick, he is uh, attributed, he's um, discovered the neutron. Okay. So now we got the three main uh, particles that we deal with the electron and the proton and the neutron. Okay. So what we have, what it was um, observed then is that the atom itself is, is mostly empty space. To give you some kind of relative idea, if we were to, if I was at the scale of, I say, a hydrogen atom, hydrogen is the first atom. So I got a nucleus and I got one electron, okay? I, if my electron, if I was a hydrogen atom, my electron would be about almost three quarters of a mile away if I was bringing up the hydrogen to my scale. And so there's a lot of empty space in between there. And even though there's that distance, there's still a force that holds that together, okay? It's a very strong force, extremely strong force. We're all familiar with nuclear bombs and so forth, what kind of devastation they can bring forth. But there's a lot of energy in the atom, a lot of energy. All right, so each atom has a small dense nucleus with 
which consists of the proton and the neutron. So that kind of, uh, that picture on the right there kind of gives you an idea of what the model was, was uh, what the model is of the atom at that time, okay? We're not sure, at the time, they weren't sure about the electrons. They knew they're just, they're out there. How they're put together was not quite known, but we learned down the road, uh, we have a model for those two, okay? Now, if, if um, the nucleus was, uh, say, the size of a small marble, to kind of give you an idea and perspective, then the atom, its radius would be the size of the Cardinal Stadium. So it's pretty big, pretty big. All right, so we have this, the subatomic particles. We have the electron, the proton, and, and the neutron uh, in the first column. Each have a symbol, the symbol E, lowercase e, with a superscript minus that represents a negative charge, okay? That is a symbol for the electron. P for the proton with superscript positive because of the proton has a positive charge. And then lowercase n for the neutron, okay? Now, and uh, so, the position or the location, the electron is outside the nucleus, whereas the proton and the neutron are, are well, they, they make up the nucleus. And there's a respective charge. Electrons have a negative charge. Um, protons have a positive charge. And the neutrons being neutral have no charge, but very, very important with respect to the stability of the overall atom. Since these, um, Weights, you know, are so so small and tiny. The masses, what what is utilized is a relative mass scale. Okay, so basically, the proton and the neutron are given a relative mass of one. Okay, because they have a roughly the same, roughly the same mass, and the electron is about one eighteen hundreds difference with respect to mass. So basically, its relative mass is given as zero. So it's very, very, very tiny. Remember, these are AMU's atomic mass units or relative weights, okay? Like me, if I'm 200 pounds, let's say somebody else weighs 400 pounds. Well, their relative weight would be two, I would be one, and their relative weight would be two because it's you know twice my weight. So that's all AMUs are just relative weights. Okay. With respect to the elements, there's 118 elements, we have what's called an, an atomic notation. In other words, write down uh, what the element is, we're gonna write down what's called the mass number, atomic number, and SY, which is the symbol. Every element has a specific symbol. Some have one letter, which would be capitalized, and a lot of them have a second letter, which is lowercase, and that's important. If, if you want to show that you're dealing with cobalt, for example, C, lowercase o, you will make sure it's lowercase o. If you were to write C uppercase o, which you have done in effect, written carbon monoxide, totally different, totally different thing to count by, all right? So on the far superscript left, we have what's called a mass number, okay? And then a uh, subscript left of the symbol is the atomic number, all right? So the atomic number gives us two bits of information. Atomic number tells us how many protons we have and for elements also tells us how many electrons. So let's, let's take, for example, any element. Let's take uh, carbon, okay? Carbon is number C right here, uh, symbol C for carbon, okay? The number on top is the atomic number. It has, it is the six. 
So six tells us that we have six protons, six electrons, okay? Nitrogen, the neighbor next to it, number seven, has seven protons, seven electrons, and so forth. Fluorine has nine protons, nine electrons. Element number 118, 118 protons, 118 electrons. The other thing to take away from this, we're talking about the elements at this point. I have any element has an equal amount of positive charges and an equal amount of negative charges. Carbon, like I stated, has six protons. That's six positives. It also has six electrons. Those are negative. So the net charge, the net charge for the element, guess what, is zero. Okay. We are going to learn that these elements, when they lose electrons, or gain electrons, they're gonna end up with a charge. And that is what you are drinking if you're drinking electrolytes with respect to the drinks that you drink. You're not eating or you're not drinking solid element of sodium. You are ingesting the sodium, what we call ion, I-O-N. And those are elements that either lose or gain electrons. Now put this in long-term memory. Remember we talked about the metals and non-metals and we use that stair step to tell us who are the non-metals and who are the metals, okay? Metals lose electrons, 100%, okay? So sodium, which is a metal, will lose an electron. And once we identify what column it's in, it's in we know how many electrons it loses, okay? Long-term memory here, non-metal, they gain electrons. And knowing what column they're in would tell us how many electrons they are gaining. And when you gain electrons, you end up with a net zero, okay? A net zero. And so fluorine has nine protons, nine electrons. When it, it's a non-metal, and it will gain an electron. So now it still has nine protons, but now it has 10 electrons. So the net charge, guess what, is a negative one, all right? Negative one, but more on that. And we'll know that just by looking at its position on the periodic table. Metals lose electrons, non-metals gain electrons because the ultimate goal is to obtain that magical eight number. For some reason, at least in our model, the strive of late losing and gaining electrons is to maintain eight electrons around the atom, with the exception of hydrogen and helium, and their goal is to maintain two electrons. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. But everybody else, is trying to get that magical eight, the octet rule. And that makes it more stable. And that is the driving force why metals lose electrons and non-metals gain electrons. It's all about these crazy electrons. All right, so um, now the numbers underneath the symbol here are what we call the atomic weight, okay? Now, to get the mass number, the mass number is a whole number. So for the particular elements that we are dealing with right now, we're going to learn that there, there are what are called isotopes. But for right now, in order to get the mass number for carbon, we just take that 12.01 and we round it up to the nearest whole number, OK? And so we got carbon here. We round that up to the nearest whole number, and that is the mass number. And then six is the atomic number, OK? Nitrogen, we can do the same thing, all right? 14, because I take 14, 0, 1, round it up to the nearest whole number. And then 
seven down here, etc. The subatomic particle that defines an element is a proton. A proton determines what element you are dealing with. You can lose or gain electrons and neutrons all day long, and it doesn't change what that element is. But the moment you lose or gain a proton, you totally change what that element is, okay? So the proton defines what that element is. So that's why carbon has six protons, nitrogen has seven. Just by picking up one more proton, you create a whole new element, you know? And it's, it's, it's analogous to Legos. If you think about it, let's say you've got, you know, a thousand Legos, all the same color. You, you can let your imagine go, imagination go out and you could build if you're into Legos and building stuff. You can build an infinite number of different things with those blue Legos, okay? These subatomic particles is analogous. By adding more protons, which all of them share the, the property, all protons share the same property, but by adding them, I create a whole new element, totally different protons, totally different uh, uh, properties, okay? For example, you know, you hear the old alchemists, alchemists are the, uh, the old guys that are trying to make gold out of lead. Well, think about this. Here's lead, number 82. It's got 18 protons, okay? Excuse me, 82 protons. Gold is right here, AU has got 79 protons. So it needs to lose well, how many? How many protons for how many protons does lead need to lose to become gold? Wouldn't you have to lose three? And guess where they're at? They're inside the nucleus, based on their model. And anytime we mess with the nucleus, it gets pretty nasty. That's where the hydrogen bomb comes into play because the nucleus fission breaks up. A lot of energy given up. It's going to be kind of tough. If you can find a way to do it, let me know. We'll patent it and uh, get it out there. <laughs> All right. But then, the, then they wouldn't be worth much because then we would just flood the market with gold and gold wouldn't be worth anything. All right. So the atomic number is, represents the number of protons and the number of electrons. The mass number is the sum of the protons and the sum of neutrons, okay? All right, so in the example we were looking at earlier, we had carbon, which was carbon 12 and six. Carbon has six protons, okay? Six protons, six electrons, and in this case, 12 minus six, gives me six neutrons, okay? Now, we're gonna learn something. When we add or subtract or remove neutrons, we create what are called isotopes. Isotopes, okay? Isotopes are determined by the neutrons. Now, we are familiar, hopefully, you know, when you do carbon dating, you may hear about, you know, you do carbon dating and figure out how old something is. What we're working with here is the, the, uh, the element carbon that is like carbon, regular carbon, the most common isotope, but it has extra neutrons. And, and we have carbon 11, carbon 12, carbon 13, and carbon 14. All of them are carbon because we didn't change the number of, of, uh, neut of the protons, but they differ in properties because they have a different number of neutrons. Uh, a lot of the elements, literally all the elements have what we call isotopes. 
and they're, they are that particular isotope, but they have an additional or maybe less number of neutrons than the most common isotope. And the way we determine the most common isotope, again, use the periodic table, okay? Because all we gotta do is just take the atomic weight of any element here, and let's take zinc, for example, okay? Zinc has an atomic weight of 65.31. Round that number to nearest hole, it gives you zinc 65. So the most common isotope is zinc 65, okay? Carbon 12, we just did carbon 12. And the way to determine that again is just to round up the atomic weight to the nearest whole number. So carbon 12 is the most common isotope. Nitrogen, round that 1401 to the nearest whole number, which is 14. The most common isotope is nitrogen 14. Oxygen already is oxygen 16, but there are other isotopes, oxygen 17, and so forth. More on that, uh, more on that here in a bit. All right, so mass number, which is a whole number, that's important. Mass number is a whole number, not to be mistaken with the atomic no, atomic weight okay, or atomic mass. And that's that decimal number you find on the periodic table. Carbon was 12.01, okay? But its mass number is a whole number. We're gonna learn why the atomic weight is a decimal number. And because we simply, this is the reason, as I stated earlier, we have carbon 11, carbon 12, carbon 13, and carbon 14, okay? All of them have six protons, okay? Where they differ is the number of neutrons. So all of those, all of those are isotopes. Each one has a different percentage out in, in the environment. Carbon 12, which is the most common, I don't know, I'm thinking it's about 98%. All the other ones have a variety of different. So what happens is this. Notice this whole numbers, right? And given the atomic number of each of these isotopes of carbon, given the percentage, okay, we, did, they, we can calculate the average of all these four isotopes given the percentage, and guess what? that ends up to 12.01. That is the number you see on the periodic table for the atomic weight. That 12.01 is the average of all the mass numbers for those isotopes and their given percentage. Just like your schoolwork, your homework is a certain percentage that contributes the overall picture, uh, X amount percentage from the overall grade. The, the homework, the activities, et cetera. And, and that's why we can take the atomic weight, round it up to the nearest whole number, and you can determine who is the most common isotope. When we take that 12.01, it is carbon 12, okay? That is the most common isotope but of about 98%. All right. so. I know there's a lot of information I'm throwing at you, but it, we're going to get put it all together, okay? Every atom of an element has the same number of protons, okay? In an element, the number of protons equals the number of electrons. And the protons, like I stated, defines what that element is. For example, carbon always has six protons. That's a carbon atom, okay? <clears throat> now, uh, masses are pretty small, so we use the atomic mass units. The proton and the neutron, roughly, we give it an approximate one AMU, one atomic mass unit. 
the electron is so small that we basically give it a zero atomic mass unit. Okay, it is it is small so small. We're going to learn that the electron, because of its small size, will have properties of light. It would behave like light, and because of that, we're able to get another model to help us out with respect to where the electrons are situated around the, the nucleus, okay? We'll learn about that. All right, so mass number, which is a whole number, I can't overemphasize that, is equal to the number of protons and number of neutrons. And so to calculate the number of neutrons, we simply take the mass number minus the number of protons, okay? And to do that, like I just stated, for the most common isotope is we take the atomic weight and we round it off to the nearest whole number, okay? And then we subtract the number of protons, which is the atomic number for that particular element. All right. <laughs> In this case, they're asking us here to write the atomic notation of this particular element. Well, here's the thing. First. They're telling you something right off the bat. Potassium hyphen 40. They're telling you which isotope you're working with, the 40. Now, let's go to potassium on the periodic table. Let's find it. Potassium has the symbol of K. We need to know that. And potassium is right here. Okay. It has 19. Its uh, atomic number is 19. It has 19 protons and 19 electrons. Right. The most common isotope of potassium is potassium 39. Notice that? They're asking you to work with potassium 40. 39, 40, the difference is one, which is one neutron. Okay, so we're dealing with an isotope of potassium. We're not dealing with the most common isotope. We're dealing with potassium 40. Let's go back to the... All right, so we know it's K the symbol, whoa, get my pen working here. Okay, symbol is K. They're telling me potassium 40, so I don't have to calculate anything. It's right there, potassium 40. I need to go look up the periodic table and I find potassium is atomic number is 19, okay? And so that is the atomic notation of potassium 40. If it was the most common isotope, right? It would be potassium 39. Note that note the common factors here. Potassium has 19 protons. Okay. There's a difference between in the mass numbers between the two. And that is because potassium 40 has one more neutron because they're asking the next question, how many neutrons are there? Well, we simply take the 40 and subtract the 19. That's it. Don't have to do anything special. So potassium 40 has 21 neutrons. What do you think potassium 39 has? How many neutrons does potassium 39 have? Anybody want to give it a shot? 20. You got it. Exactly. It's got 20. All right. Now. All right. Now, <laughs> here they're asking you, all right, uh, write the atomic notation of a bromine 81. Well, First of all, is we need a periodic table, and we, I 
we make reference to that all the time. Okay, bromine is one of the elements you, you're gonna need to learn anyway. In fact, everybody down here in group seven, these are, they have a special name. How do fluorine, notice that fluorine, chlorine, bromine, I-N-E, okay? I-N-E. Now, in the morning, some of you are brushing your teeth with fluoride, I-D-E, totally different. You're not brushing your teeth with fluorine. You're brushing your teeth with something fluoride, I-D-E. We're going to learn that the difference between I-D-E and I-N-E, when we speak about, when, I, when you read or see or I talk about I-N-E, we're talking about the element. When we talk about the I-D-E, I-D, we're talking about, guess what? The ion, fluoride, chloride, bromide, okay? Iodide. In fact, the nonmetals change their name when they gain electrons, and they will gain electrons because they're nonmetals. And we're going to learn why why that is a driving force, okay? We'll learn that. So here we got bromine. Now, based on this, looking at, uh, taking its atomic weight of 79.90 and uh, uh, rounding it up to the nearest whole number, that tells me that the uh, most common isotope is bromine 80. And its atomic number is 35, 35 protons. Okay, so let's go back to this. And so here we're talking about bromine 81. So again, we are dealing with not the most common isotope. Okay, this isotope has one more, one more, um, one more uh, a neutron had a senior moment there for a second, okay? Now, they both here, bromine 80, which is the most common isotope, has 35 protons, 35 electrons, whereas bromine 81 has 35 protons, 35 electrons, and they differ, they differ with respect to one neutron. And the fact, that fact in itself, uh, it gives them totally different properties. The neutrons here, we just simply subtract 81 minus 35, okay, which is 46. How many neutrons does a bromine 80 have? I want you to take a shot of that, okay? 80 minus 35? 45. You got it, 45, okay? All right. 45. Now, at this point in time, you don't, you, you really think about it, you really don't have to memorize anything. We're using the periodic table. We're going to go find the elements. Obviously, you'll become familiar with the elements with time. Find out where it's at. Find its atomic number. You know, if they're giving you bromine 81, and sometimes, occasionally, you may see it written as BR81. Okay, so that's bromine 81, same thing. Okay, so they're telling you which isotope you're working with. I'm going to say specifically say, hey, using the most common isotope, how many protons does bromine have? Well, in that case, you just go round up the atomic weight, okay? For uh, atomic weight that's on the periodic table. All right, this, again, here deals with isotopes, kind of briefly mentioned earlier. But if we look at carbon, there it shows there's one more carbon 11, but uh, there, there are carbon 12, carbon 13, carbon 14, okay? All of them are carbon. All of them have the same number of protons, same number of electrons. Where they differ is the number of, of neutrons. And so uh, carbon 12 has six neutrons, okay? They all have six protons but carbon-12 has six neutrons, 
carbon 13 has seven uh, neutrons and carbon 14 has eight neutrons, okay? Um, here's a table and we're dealing with oxygen, okay? Uh, obviously three isotopes of oxygen. Uh, the most common isotope is oxygen 16, okay? The mass number, well, they're all oxygen, so they're all gonna have same number of protons and same number of electrons, okay? Otherwise, if the number of protons are different, it would be a totally different element, but we are talking about oxygen. That's it, all right? The mass number, well, it's given to you. Here's carbon 16, here's carbon 17, here's carbon 18. It's given to you right there, so you don't have to calculate anything. The only calculation you need to do is the number of neutrons, and it's simply the mass number minus the number of protons. Hence, you end up with eight, nine, and 10, respectively for oxygen 16, oxygen 17, and oxygen 18. You see how that works? Okay, now, this is kind of an explanation which I briefly touched about why in the periodic table, uh, the atomic weights are decimal numbers, okay? Because in essence, basically what they are is the average number for all of the isotopes of that particular element given their percentage that they exist, okay? And so when, and they're whole numbers. So carbon 11, 11, 12, 13, 14, all whole numbers. And if, for example, you're going to average out five and six, is, you know, isn't it the average five and a half, right? You have a decimal number, that's the average. And if, if I had more five than I had six, that average may be lean toward the five more than the six. Right now, when I say the average between five and six, I'm assuming equal contribution for five and six, hence my average is five and a half. But if one has more than the other, that average moves over left, left or right, depending on which number contributes more, okay? And that is why we don't use the atomic weights for sig figs, because what we are doing is we're taking, we are averaging whole numbers. And when you average whole numbers, you have an infinite number of sig figs, okay? Infinite number of sig figs. So, Atomic weights are not utilized with respect to um, determining sig figs because we will be doing calculations using the atomic weights of the elements or the atomic weights of compounds, All right? So we take, here's carbon 11, 12, 13, and 14, their relative percentage of contribution. So you can see that if we were to average these numbers out, Okay, given the percentage of contribution that that number averages out to 12.01, which is what you see on the, periodic on the periodic table. And that is why we can take that 12.01 and, and round it to the nearest whole number. And that gives us the most common isotope for carbon. That would be carbon 12, okay? All right, and so um, there you go, all the same information I just told you. And so you might re run into a question like this. It says, all right, which one of these two is the most common, most abundant isotope? And they talk about lithium-6 or lithium-7. Now, you don't have to memorize anything other than to determine the symbol for lithium. Okay, and it is one of the, the 20 elements that you should be starting to become familiar with, and is number three. Okay, you can see here that number three, here's lithium. I take that 6.09, round it up, so guess what? Most common isotope is a lithium seven, based on the periodic table, and 
That is correct. Okay. I do the same thing with chlorine. Chlorine, I'm going to bring up the periodic table again. So you chlorine, notice chlorine, not chloride. Chlorine is way over here. Okay. Number 17. Number 17. <laughs> and uh, round up that 35.45, the nearest whole number, and that becomes chlorine 35 is the most common isotope. Okay. Nothing had to be memorized. You just had to find the element on the periodic table uh, to answer this que question, which is the most abundant isotope. Okay. Uh, a lot of the elements are radioactive and very unstable. In fact, um, in fact, the, the atomic weights that you see with parentheses, that's an indication that we have a uh, radioactive uh, isotope or radioactive compound, very difficult to get short half-lives or something. And so you really can get a good uh, atomic weight. So uh, number 96, curium, named after Madame Curie. Okay. Uh, speaking of Madame Curie, does anybody by chance know where Madame Curie was originally from? I have no idea. Yeah. Madame Curie was originally from Poland. She went to France to get her education, married her husband, who was um, Curie, last name Curie, uh, got two Nobel Prizes, one in chemistry, and I forget what the other one was, but uh, the reason she left Poland uh, was because uh, she could not get into get a higher education because being a woman at that time, they were not allowed, it's terrible. I think they did make a movie for her or it was a TV show I've seen. Yeah, and uh, anyway, yeah, very uh, awesome uh, scientists. Okay, so chemical formulas. We're gonna do a lot with chemical formulas and then we're kind of gonna introduce you to these now. What we're doing here is kind of make you aware of uh, chemical formulas. They're not going to tell us much about the bonding order. We'll get to that here, you know, how, how things are bonded and everything. What we are just attempting to do is to have you be able to identify how many different elements are in a particular uh, chemical formula, okay? And the reason we do that is because take that atomic weight, we are able to calculate the atomic weight of a chemical compound based on counting all the elements in that particular uh, formula that we're given. Okay. For example, we talked about H2O. There are two hydrogens and one oxygen. Okay. So for a total of three atoms. Okay, we have a formula here that is uh, C3H6O3, okay? Don't really care about what it is. It could be a multiple things, okay? It's a very general formula. And what you need to take away from this is simply that there are three carbons, there are six hydrogens, and there are three oxygen atoms in that whole compound for a total of 12 atoms, okay? Eventually, with time, we are gonna take the atomic weights of carbon, which was 12.01, multiply by three because there's three carbons. We're gonna take the atomic weight of hydrogen, which is 1.01, multiplied by six, okay? And then take the atomic weight of oxygen, which is 16, multiply all that by three, Add all that together, and that becomes the what we call the molar mass of that particular compound. Okay. And that gives us a whole slew of more information. 
but right now we just want to identify how many of each are there. Now, whenever you see a parenthesis, you might as well get learn this now. That parenthesis tells you it is a unit. We don't separate them, we count them as a unit. There is a subscript outside that parenthesis. There's two that tells you that there are two NH4 units in this particular compound, okay? Now, things like this will come into play if you go to the periodic table. If on the bottom left of the periodic table, let me uh, shrink this a little bit. We have a table that eventually you really need to become familiar with. These are called polyatomic ions. And notice the one we have out here is NH4. That is a unit. In fact, it's got its own little charge. Okay. Whenever we need more than one, we put a parenthesis around it. In this case, we have shown the NH4 parenthesis subscript two, okay, which tells us there are two NH4 units and they have a particular name called ammonium. All right, so that tells us uh, also there's one carbon and there's three oxygens. So within the unit in the parentheses, there are two nitrogens and eight hydrogens, okay? We got one carbon and three oxygens, all overall for a total of 14 atoms. This, by the way, is called ammonium carbonate. But more on that much later. All right, I think I got one more slide. And then I'm gonna show you one more thing and we'll, we'll call it a day. Here, uh, uh, H3PO4. FYI, you can keep this, we'll be, it'll come, this will come back, but this is phosphoric acid. You drink a lot of soda pop, you're drinking in a lot of the H2PO4, but it contains three hydrogens, one phosphorus, and four oxygens. Okay. Uh, the next one, it's calcium hydroxide. This is called calcium hydroxide. Notice we got the parentheses, that's a unit, and it has its own little name. If you want to go to that table, you'll see a OH unit, it's called hydroxide. It has its own specific name. It even has its own charge. And that's, that's important too, the charge. And so we have uh, one calcium, two oxygens, two hydrogens. And then the next one is it, called aluminum, aluminum sulfate. Again, two aluminums here, subscript two, but a parentheses, you go to that polyatomic unit, polyatomic unit table, look for the SO4 and you'll find it there. It's got its own name called sulfate. You know, we're, we're picking up on naming compounds, right? Aluminum sulfate. There's three of those units. And there are three for a particular reason. We're going to learn that too. So I've got three sulfurs and 12 oxygens. All right. And we got calcium hydroxide, which I can mix up with sulfate. So I got calcium sulfate or aluminum hydroxide, mix and match. You're going to learn here that we, with the metals and the other components, we can do mix and match. We can go potassium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide. You know, right now, you, you probably got a couple hundred a database of about a couple hundred compounds that you can start putting together by mixing and matching. All right, so we have a total of eight atoms for phosphoric acid, five atoms for calcium hydroxide, and a total of 17 atoms for aluminum sulfate, okay? So this whole exercise is to be able to identify how many atoms of each and how many total atoms of each in a particular compound. Eventually you're going to take that information and be able to calculate and determine the atomic, uh, the, the um, what we call the molar mass, which is important, okay? Laws of definite proportion or composition tells us that compounds always contain, uh, always contain the same elements in the same proportion by mass. Be it, for example, water, H2O. We can calculate that and we can determine that 
in the formula H2O, hydrogen makes up 11.2% of it. Oxygen makes up 88.8%. And that is true for all molecules of water, be it we analyze it here in Arizona or analyze it on the moon or wherever it could be. H2O always had that component, okay? Some of these cal sample calculations we're gonna learn how to do, do a little bit later. All right, that being said, ladies and gentlemen, guess what? Congratulations, you are done with chapter four, okay? I wanna do one last thing. I wanna go to the uh, site, the website before we leave. Uh, on there, this will help you with this particular chapter and how things are put together. Uh, under additional chemical resources, there is a link called build an atom, okay? Click on it. When you click on it, it will form, uh, generate a simulation software that here, just click on the first one, Adam, okay? Now, what this shows is, is the following. You have two little buckets here, labeled protons, neutrons, and electrons. When I grab a proton and I, and first of all, I bring it close to the atom, guess what? I just created hydrogen, okay? Grab another proton. I can put it way out here and from the nucleus and it, oh, or closer and it will go to the center. Why? Because that's where it's made. Notice the more protons I put in, the more different uh, uh, elements that I'm creating, okay? So let's go back to hydrogen. Now we have an electrons. Our motto is the electrons orbit around the nucleus. So if I grab, if I grab an electron and I put it in the center, it's going to go out to the, this dotted line. We're going to learn that these electrons ex exist in specific energy levels, okay? And uh, there are seven energy levels. Notice we create a hydrogen. We got one proton, one, one electron, okay? That is hydrogen. By And our net charge is zero because it's one positive, one negative. When I took the electron off, guess what? I got a positive charge, right? I take the electron, put it back in, net zero, okay? When I add a neutron, okay, my mass number changes. Let me grab that neutron. But right now, I got a mass number of one for hydrogen. There are three isotopes, two extra, two, uh, there's heavy water. There's uh, H2O, and then there is D2O, deuterium, and that is just hydrogen with an additional neutron. And there's uh, T2O, titanium, which is the other isotope of hydrogen. So, okay, so play with that. It gives you or give you a, a good picture of um, of how these basic components of uh, subatomic particles of protons, neutrons, electrons are put together, okay? Also, it gives you a little bit of stability. The T is not very stable. Take one out. Uh, heavy water is stable, okay? So play with that. I'll give you an idea of, about that. Uh, let's stop. About how the atom is put together, and it gives you a, more, a better picture of it. All right, sorry I took a little bit extra time. Um, don't forget the 